We're recording today on the lands of the Jagera people and acknowledge the traditional elders here, past and present. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm a digital marketer and small business owner. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea. I'm a former registered nurse and midwife in private practice and a community advocate. Welcome to Beyond the Rona. We're on a journey here to find out what our community members think are the big problems and the big solutions as we emerge from the pandemic. And today we're joined by Jackie Skeen, who's the Managing Director of My Logan Realty, and she has over 10 years experience in the real estate industry. So hi, Jackie. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, pleasure. Um, I, I first heard you speak on a uh, Facebook Live uh, for the Aus Property Investors uh, Facebook group. And a bit of a shout out to my mate, Jeff, who who does a great job running that group. Um, but you, yeah, you were uh, brought on as a, as a guest because you're an expert in the Logan area. And I think for everyone that was outside of Logan, outside of Brisbane and Queensland, they learned a lot from your insights about, yeah, each particular sub-region and down to the suburb level. Um, just looking at your website, uh, you um, mentioned that uh, Logan has in the past had an unjustified bad rap, like that idea of, you know, a Logan Bogan and, yeah, that, that kind of like perhaps stigma around Logan. And we, Andrew and I, certainly uh, experienced that also growing up here. I guess what is your view on Logan today? And do you think that that image is getting worse or getting better? I do definitely think the image is improving. Um, so it's, you know, it's just very diverse. There's lots of different communities and because it's such a region, you know, there's 400,000 people who live there and there's all different, there's lots of community spirit, which obviously with the recent flood events and everything that goes on just in the world, we tend to have a very strong community bond. Um, very diverse and, you know, ethnicity and um, careers and jobs, and it's just all types of people. So um, like anything, you know, there's probably a portion of people that, um, that everyone's different. You could have a portion of people in the top 5% and the bottom 5% of socioeconomic area in general. So it's quite diverse as in there's multi-million dollar properties, and then there's properties that are you know, under 200,000. So there's, um, and all types of people live in them. So yeah, it's, I do think it's improving um, as there's infrastructure and funding coming in and community projects and everything that goes with that, it's definitely improving. But I do still feel a stigma. Um, like my mm. husband was working on the Gold Coast yesterday and um, a plumber he was working with made a comment, oh, mate, you're on the Gold Coast now. Don't bring your Logan attitude here. So there's still a it's, mild larrikin banter about it, maybe. Yes. Um, yes. But there's still a long way to go for us as well, I think. Um, definitely yeah. room for improvement. Yeah. And it looks like council's also trying to address that. Um, they've got this campaign um, live on, on social media at the moment. And we'll actually play this um, here. So if you're watching this podcast on on YouTube or Facebook, here it is. Yeah, they don't know just what to do with me. Promise this is nothing new to me. If you came in here to ruin me, hope you write not a eulogy. I was tailor made beautifully. You can never fry two of me. <laughs> Look how I'm shining. Cold turn into diamonds. I need a moment of silence. This is our moment. Always on the grind till the sun come on us. This is our moment. This is our moment. This is our moment. Moment. Ah. Gladiator in this auto war. What you think that I've been fighting for? Got a cape ball like a superhero. They rushing at me like a matador. Nah, nah, I don't need your energy. I don't need the negativity. I'm just trying to bring my people up. Promise y'all I got the remedy. Straight to the roof, tell them we bringing the troops. We got a little surprise, you thinking that we need the truth. We give it 120, we never make an excuse. So go run and tell everybody down and every coming for you. This is our moment, always on the ground to the sun come on us. This is our moment, this is our moment, this is our moment, this is our moment, moment. 
so Jackie, campaigns like this, do you think they're effective at kind of addressing that image? Hmm. It's a interesting question. I think we should be doing, um, I think we should be doing everything we can. And I think campaigns probably attribute to it. Um, but you know, you just have to look at the data on, I think it's more of identifying what is unique about Logan as a region. And then, you know, what's our niche, what's our thing that makes us so special and playing into that. And I think it is like diversity community and all those, you know, unique things that we have and, um, maybe just more so making, yeah, having our brand almost like, what is the brand of Logan? What do we stand for? And, um, just, you know, working as a community to improve that. So yeah, yeah. I think there's no harm in it, but is there different ways? Like, yeah, I think it's what's going to improve it is combining all these different things we can do and yeah. time. So yeah. 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 Um, and you, so you obviously manage a lot of rental properties all, all around Logan and you did mention the floods before and we've just kind of, you know, uh, still cleaning up from, from that. And some people were particularly, um, you know, negatively impacted by that. What was your experience on the ground, um, with, yeah, the, some of the properties you manage? Um, I've been very lucky because we weren't affected a lot of my properties. I had a couple of roof leaks, couple of drainage yeah. issues. Um, there was a house actually in Brisbane, uh, in Mancravat that the second level did go under, um, because of drainage issues on the property and the, um, storm water. So, you know, it wasn't cause there was so much rain. It wasn't just affected by like the regional flooding. It was that we do see in Logan, you know, often it was very much like, um, inundation flooding. So there was a lot of issues that came with that as well. So yeah, very lucky. All of our tenants, um, other than that one at Macrobat have been really great. And, um, yeah, just feeling the community vibes again in terms of like everyone trying to help and do their part. And like me personally, I, um, didn't have the time to physically help, but I've just pretty much torn the house apart and donated 12 bags worth of clothes and towels and sheets and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff that I needed to do anyway. And this stuff is some, someone's family can use it. So, um, yeah, mm. trying to do. Totally. Jackie, do you feel that, the, yeah, um, do you feel that the landlords have like a duty of care to do things like putting stormwater drains in people's yards and, and, you know, preparing oh. properties for things like, um, you know, eventually another flood, those sorts of things. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, both, both sides of it, as in, we want to make sure that it's nice and livable and safe for the tenant. And we also want to make sure that we're doing preventative repairs to ensure that the property is not going to be constantly damaged. So definitely, um, it's hard to say with this event because obviously we had 80% of the annual rainfall in such a short period. So, um, considering that amount of rain, I think most properties, uh, or my properties luckily held up pretty good. So, mm -hmm. and then it's just working in with the tenants. That's what I said to these particular tenants, because they've gone from having a five bedroom, two bathroom home to having a three bedroom, one bathroom because downstairs is flood affected. So just yeah. working in with them and saying, look, obviously this is a natural disaster. We've been um, as reactive as possible in terms of getting insurance and getting the repairs done. And then obviously having discussions regarding compensation and rent reductions and those things as well. So that's what okay. you can do in those situations. Um, so yeah. yeah, just dealing with a bad situation, I guess. Um, there was a, uh, article, which we'll share in the, uh, show notes, um, published recently on my newsfeed, um, dot com that AU, which was about a rental crisis in Logan and kind of broadly more, um, talking about the, the greater Brisbane housing crisis, but particularly in Logan. Um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, increases to rent and there's kind of, you know, rental, um, shortages. And one of the quotes from the article was talking about, um, migration from interstate being a major factor, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that, Jackie, what do you see, uh, the kind of 
um, main um, tension points at the moment with rentals? So what we've seen with obviously there's a lot of elements caused by the pandemic that um, have been a ripple effect with this. So one of them being that lockdowns, we stopped building as much and we stopped importing materials. So there's been a real crisis in terms of the builds that we would usually produce every year have not come to the normal time frame. So there's a whole element of the people who were potentially renting at that time having to stay in that house for longer. So that rental is no longer not available. The what caused this, there's a combination of lots of things, but one interstate migration to the property boom has been driven by owner occupiers. So that means that these, so, and also investors jump on a boom. We haven't seen gains like this in 10, yeah. so long. So they're jumping on the boom. They're selling what was a rental to an owner occupier. So now that and removing that is stock no longer mm. an owner, uh, no longer a mm. rental. The stock has decreased with that. So mm. when a property market's booming because of an owner occupier demand, all these rentals are no longer rentals. And then mm. with that as well, people upgrading their home. So selling their home and then moving to their dream home or more lifestyle properties. So, um, yeah, that goes into the supply factor and then the migration on top of that. So you got the building not happening, the owner occupier boom, the migration of masses of mass, like 82,000 something people, I think is the last thing I saw. 82,000 yeah. people coming up into our area. They're coming from higher incomes, typically living in Sydney and, you know, in the city, Melbourne, they've got the yes. money. They see no qualms in paying, you know, eight, $900 a week rent. They're offering more. Um, mm. so yeah, naturally when you combine all those things, there is a crisis. Yeah. So the people who and, seem to you know, be you mentioned constantly, the pandemic and... sorry, the, go, go, the people Andrew, who, go, 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 go. The, <laughs> the people who seem to be constantly missing out are, you know, and they were, they were missed out of last year's budget as well is young people, older women, disabled people, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so young people, obviously with what you're talking about, Jackie, um, you know, they're not going to be able to afford a house and they can't afford the rising rents, um, you know, with this lack of rental properties being um, made available because, you know, obviously with the decrease in the amount of stock available, um, the rent rises as well. Um, so um, mm -hmm. that's young people missing out again, older women missing out again, um, you know, and obviously we all have to work now until we're, what, 75. Um, and... Um, older women are becoming, you know, the fastest group of homeless people now, um, you know, mm. and, and disabled people, there's no stock for disabled people either. Um, yeah. Have you got any thoughts on these groups of people, especially of what they do for housing? Yeah. Well, I know that there's a lot of talk in the investment community regarding the NDIS bills, which are extremely highly um, lucrative and that is for an investor. So that is good that there's more NDIS new builds coming on the market. So that should help mitigate it. I actually just came up with this brilliant idea when you were just talking about that for the women, the, you know, 55 to 75 year old women, there should be like an organization where, you know, you, they match their personality types of three or four women. And then they can go in as a share house almost where they co Yeah. Because I think that's maybe the way, because the rents are rising and they're like, mm. sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I don't think they're ever going to go back to what they are. I think it's inflated mm. and this is mm. where they are now. And mm. you can't get a lot for under $400 a week. And even as the weeks go on, there's not a lot under 450 500 So yeah. um, we need to probably be creative on um, having ideas like that where you can, you know, build more community within, they have the mm. connection of the other housemates or whatever, and they suit um, 
doing that. But yeah, in terms of a lady that maybe earns forty, fifty thousand dollars on her own, it's just I yeah. don't think there's a lot of housing options for that person on their own anymore. So yeah. it's um yeah, and then you look at the inflation in general that we're having in Logan and Queensland, like fuels two dollars. The cost of groceries yeah. is yeah massively gone up. The yeah, cost of everything has gone up. So I don't know if um, the way we used to do things in terms of that lovely tenant on her own living in maybe a three bedroom, one bathroom in Waterford. I don't know if they can afford to live there on their own for uh, too much longer. And I think that mm. point you make about, um, yeah, the fact that these increases have happened and I'm not going to go back at feel like I know um, one person described that to me as like, you know, um, you can't like unburn a piece of toast. Like it's, it, it seems like that's unfortunately for, for a lot of people, like that's where the, the market is. And, and so it's lo looking for solutions, like you mentioned, like community led solutions to these issues. Government has a, ro a massive role to play here as well. Yeah. Um, to, you know, provide that kind of sa safety net and that kind of like support, especially for, um, for people doing it tough. And, you know, you, you mentioned as well, um, with the pandemic, like, I'm, because this podcast kind of, um, sprung up because of the pandemic, this is why we started it. Mm. Um, what other pandemic, um, issues have, have, have you seen in the last two years? Because I guess some of those things around growth in Logan have been happening pre pandemic, but is there anything else that's kind of like unique to the pandemic that's had a knock on effect to, to housing? Oh yeah. There's, there's been so many and you know, when something like a pandemic happens, there's always going to be any policy that the government brings in. There is ripple effects to everything, you know, the housing, um, like what they did with the RTA with not allowing evictions and those kind of things as well. It's that attributed to the low vacancy and the low stock. So those things, yes, they might seem like a good idea in theory, but the ripple effect of that is there's not as much stock on the market and lots of people right. as tenants, the problem from the pandemic was investors were selling their houses and they were selling them to owner occupiers. Mm. That tenant who potentially has lived there for 10 years now has to move out and find a property. But the eviction, um, like when the, they put all the freezes on everything, that stock that would have normally come available was no longer available. So that right. um, lots of increase of homelessness. Um, mm. Yeah, there's been a lot and mental health. I'm, yeah. There's been a lot of, my sister's actually a clinical psychologist and I've got friends who work at the Lifeline Call Center. Um, and they said at the peak, there was a four week wait on getting a call back from yeah. Lifeline. And um, just, you know, like you look at all the research that in mental health that goes towards when people are feeling depressed and suicidal and it's lack of connection. And when you're in lockdowns and I'm quite the extrovert as well, I like to spend time with people and connect mm. and see their faces as well. It, it's such a small thing to see a mask. Um, like it's a mask, but in saying that people, it's been proven that people don't smile as much because they know they can't see your smile. So something as small mm. as that, um, I find is a ripple effect and it makes people feel less connected and when they're feeling already depressed about the future and uncertain and disconnected, of course, our depression and mental health, that's another, you know, that's another crisis in itself. So, um, yeah, I'm very passionate about the mental health of people um, and what that Jackie, looks do like. You feel and, like, you know, we can, yeah, you go. Jackie, do you feel like, generally landlords in your experience actually care about the tenants or do you feel like they're in it to make a quick buck? Um, so what I will say about landlords is my investors care because I'm very selective. I won't work with C grade investors who don't, um, I won't work with them. I have, you know, medium to high fees and these investors, it's certainly not a quick buck. They, 
have to, um, you know, there's a lot of cash outlay for them to do that. And generally there's a lot of sacrifice they've had to do to get into the property market to start creating that wealth that they Mm -hmm. can have more freedom in their life. So all my investors care about their tenants. We look after the people and I don't take on C-class investors, but certainly there are always people out there who are in it for, um, there are so, I, I, and same as real estate agents, so many agents in Logan and in Brisbane who just see tenants as, you know, not on their level and they look down on them. Um, and they don't treat them as people. And that is, um, yeah, you know, that's, that's something I want to change in the industry as well, because it's a problem that like the tenants feel so judged and unsupported by our industry where Mm. the purpose of real estate and agents is to support those people going through that change. So, um, yeah, there's always going to be that 5% or 10% of investors who are greedy. Um, but also when you look at the rent rises and what they have to do, obviously the markets increase 25, 30%. What tends to happen when the market increases It's generally about six months, the rent start to rise because the mm-hmm. vacancy rates and everything like that. So, you know, the, um, the, it's a natural part of it. And it's not, I think property investing as a whole, the point of it is to create freedom and independence and wealth for the people prepared to take the risks. But I do also think that there should be more policy in terms of social housing and those things. I don't think property investing, I think a portion of it could be a vessel for more, um, you know, charity and community aspects, but that's what you can do when you create wealth as well. Like, you can't change the world if you're struggling to get by. If you can create genuine wealth, you can do things for your community and put things in place. So there's, um, yeah, that's a part of change, I guess, that these things tend to cost money. Yeah. I I, um, listened to your, um, a previous podcast that that you were on as well, which you made a really good point about, yeah, the fact that I think, yeah, in rent- renters' eyes, there's certainly, yeah, some, and, and I used to rent, so at the moment, yeah, both Andrew and I are um, in our own homes, but it's certainly, um, you know, had the experience of renting and being on, on that side and having good experiences and bad experiences. And I think the point that you made on the other podcast about, yeah, that, you know, you kind of like understand the, the applicant's character and, and kind of like build empathy with them. I think that was really good um, really unique. Um, cause I, I feel like as you say, yeah, a lot in the industry, um, don't, don't have that same level of, yeah, just, just kind of basic empathy, I guess. Mm. Um, and, and not judging a book by its character kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And it's something I personally want to make an impact in this world, in this industry to change that mm. because it like, it flips the whole, it flips the whole narrative on it. I guess if you, start seeing, um, yeah. And start seeing them as people and wanting to help them. It um, it just changes everything and it makes the tenants feel like just appreciated and, um, yeah, lots of, lots of things that go with that whole thing. And I do think our industry is one that has a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Um, also I think people deserve to live in a place where, you know, if they say that their, for example, their toilet is broken or their bathroom needs fixing, that you know that it is fixed. I mean, you hear so many horror stories of the the landlord not coming and fixing these things in a timely manner. You know, it's just horrible when you hear these these stories. Yeah, of renters. Yeah, and I suppose a portion of that is education for the tenants as well, that they do have rights and there's the whole mm. RTA and um, there's a whole legislation about properties having to be, you know, maintained and kept mm. livable and safe for tenants. So a, um, there's a lot of misconceptions in our industry that, oh, if I report that, the owner's going to evict me and this and that. So right. tenants... Um, there's a lot of education that could be improved so that they 
are more aware of their rights and what they no, can right. do and that, you know, your toilet is blocked, but in the RTA legislation, if you've got one toilet that's considered an emergency repair, you can spend up to two weeks worth of rent to get that repair done if the agent's not actioned it. So there's, there's a lot of layers of um, protection in there. And mm. I think mm. if more tenants knew what their rights were, um, mm. that would help with, um, yeah, everything. Yeah, with helping to like and to bridge those communication gaps. Yeah. On the point of uh, kind of government's role in this, I guess I, another just to borrow another point you made, Jackie, on on um, on the Facebook Live you did, you talked a bit about um, Flagstone and Yarra Bilba, and I think that was really quite interesting. So these areas in the south and, and southwest of, of Logan are, have almost been earmarked, or they were earmarked as priority development areas by council. There's something in the order about 27,000 new homes going into Flagstone. Um, and you did talk about just, you know, that, that what that's going to mean for the area and the need for, yeah, public services, roads, transport, all that kind of thing. Where do, where are you seeing this at the moment? Like, what's I guess the latest on that, and what what in your eyes is is perhaps lacking from some of that planning? So I live about seven minutes from Flagstone. So I right. we are on acreage, and we um, I'm not sure you guys live in the area Scott Lane. We're not. In, we're in yeah. the northern part of Logan. Oh right, yeah. right, okay. Um, so there's a road that is the main thoroughfare to Flagstone that is a fully flood affected road. We have yeah. just waited nine months. It was meant to be finished. The project was meant to be finished this month. We've waited nine months everywhere. I have to go. It takes an extra 10 minutes because I can't use that main road. Mm -hmm. It's been closed for nine months during the flood event. It went four and a half meters above the bridge. Wow. That's the main road to Flagstone. It's coming back one lane each way as well. So mm. they, they've they closed it for nine months. They've not even had the foresight to say, look, we've approved this DA, you know, SDA approval for 27,000 new lots in this area. And one of the main thoroughfares is coming back one lane, you know. It's... um. It's just ridiculous. Like, and it's coming back. It's it's not even been raised above the one in one hundred year flood height because this flood mm. came to the one in one hundred year flood height. They know that flood height. They have hydrologist reports for it, and they still have not raised it above that. So that project's costing Logan. I don't even know. I can't remember what it was. I want to say five hundred million, but I don't think it's that high. <laughs> um, so just that kind of reactiveness of like, and it's not even finished. It's not even coming back two lanes. So the yeah. traffic and infrastructure out here is absolutely disgraceful. They build yeah. the houses and then they wait mm -hmm. the rates to do it. So, um, yeah. And then when they do it, they do like the Mount Lindsay highway is another example that has been, there's so much construction in this area for infrastructure. It is so slow. It is painful the way they do it. And they just do it as a band-aid. They put on one lane. They put on one lane here. Mm. Like, where's the... Look at Springfield, for example. Yes, they've had a lot of growth. And yes, there is some congestion around there. But what a beautiful um, plan that they did, that they built mm. the motorway and then they built the estate. And then they built the shops. And then they built the True. industrial. Where, like, Logan, where is the... Um, where is that? Mm -hmm. Where is that? But also Flagstone. Flagstone is actually you know, quite far out from the city, if you think about it. A lot of people do work in closer into the city. There's no industrial in there. You know, there's a little bit coming into Yarra Bilba now, which is great. But mm. where are these people all meant to work? Yeah, true. Yes. So that's the, um, that's my problem, which I think a solution to that would be more incentives in terms from working from home and for entrepreneurship yeah. and people starting small businesses mm. that they can work from home but there's um it's very slow the infrastructure very poorly planned and um you can yeah. see great examples of great planning in places like springfield and does the internet yeah. work out there 
Um, so that's all NBN. So they ran the NBN out there seven years ago. So a big problem is actually the phone reception in terms of mm. um, mobile phone reception. Um, yeah. For example, my mobile phone reception is poor at my house, but we do Wi-Fi calling. So if you can use the Wi-Fi to call. Um, but yeah, there's pretty poor infrastructure in terms of mobile phone and um internet delays as well with getting yeah. the infrastructure to the street. Yeah. That, that also that point about, um, yeah, you know, the, where are these people meant to work? I rem remembered kind of, you know, skimming through council and that, I think that included as well, state government, um, was kicking in, I think 40 million for, for a road, um, network in there as well. But like it, it was also meant to be a really big benefit of this was local jobs. And I think, yeah, where Logan has traditionally been very, very much based on, you know, industry jobs and, you know, light manufacturing and, you know, that kind of thing that can be, can actually support um, local local trades and local jobs. It's like, yes, that is a good question. Where, where, where is that in terms of it's, it's just another big question mark, right? It's like, yes, it's, it was on a press release, but where is it actually happening like on the ground? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, the thing with roadworks and those kind of projects is, that is a job for someone temporarily, exactly. Uh, but that's not actually sustainable in terms of long-term growth yeah. and um, all the things. So the that's definitely a concern because the traffic out here is a nightmare. It is absolutely. I'm so blessed I get mm. to work from home, but you know yeah. it's terrible. And there's just even more houses to come, and these people. You know, there's trades, there's all types of people who live in them. So there's more cars on the road. The infrastructure is slow. Um, mm. Yeah, it's... Um, so lots, lots of room for improvement then. Um, <laughs> yeah, not I guess. negative Nelly talking about the negatives. <laughs> no, but it's, it's so true. You know, I think that government oversight and just... It's, it's just like, what's the quickest, fastest, cheapest way we can do this to... Yeah push the initiative out, but then it lacks all of that kind of longer term investment and, and planning. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's been great chatting with you, Jackie. We'd, we'd like to end with basically our, uh, the same question that we ask all of our guests is what are, what are some ideas? What are your three big ideas for improving the housing situation in Logan? Okay, cool. I'll bring them up on my phone. I love this question because I think this is how we're going to solve a lot of our social and community issues. It's, it's not only just talking about the things we could do, someone, um, taking the initiative and actioning it. And that's where I was mentioning both before, because if you have that, mm. you have the resource to do things. And that's where I would like to do a lot more non-for-profit work as I go through my career and everything. Um, yeah. because that's how things are going to happen. So my number one, uh, my first one is, less red tape and council fees for building granny flats and building underneath of high sets to rent them separately. So doing this, like I said before, I don't think the rents are going to decrease and it just wouldn't make a smart investment for um, investors to buy it and they would just not invest in our state. So mm. an affordable solution for tenants is, you know, having a high set house where it might be a three bedroom, one bathroom, Dan says might be a double garage with a storage space. The problem with a lot of the builds in the eighties was it's not 2.4 meters. So all these mm. houses are just storage. It's nothing. What we could do is have less red tape surrounding the height. Obviously it couldn't be under two meters or 2.1 yes. or something yeah. like that. Um, but if they have an affordable two bedroom, one bathroom place for people in their sixties or seventies or low income earners that then becomes their own private place. It's safe and it's very affordable. And that could be, um, done where it's a rental upstairs or it could be an owner occupier upstairs and that's helping them pay their mortgage and pay the cost of living that's increasing as well. So I think if we removed a lot of red tape and like, and even the fees associated for you to get a certificate of occupancy to rent out downstairs separately, it's $16,000. For investors or you know a married couple wanting to pay their mortgage the first two years rent is 
goes to the council and then that's not including mm. any renovation costs to make it a nice habitable space. So um, tax breaks for subletting as well. Like I said before, with if we were to do, you know, more housing um, where a four bedroom house is split between a couple of similar personality types or similar women in similar situations where they also have connection and community and affordability. Um, that's something yeah. that we could really look into that's going to make their lives more enjoyable and more fulfilling. And it will also make it more affordable for them. Um, and something I'm really passionate about is, you know, private investment for like having private rentals and having more emergency and domestic violence emergency accommodation where they can have somewhere safe to go. There's not a three, four week wait. They can get into somewhere safe and, um, you know, feel secure. Um, That'd be I great. I can think of anything yeah. worse than not having somewhere safe. Like that just is really, um, yeah, it would be a terrible situation to be in. So I think yeah. if we had, rather than all the red tape with, you know, Rent Connect and all the things like I've worked a lot with them, but there is so much red tape that goes against, yeah. you know, common sense at times and goes against like the human needs of people. Um, so yeah, I think if there was a little bit less red tape and a little bit more empathy and proactive support, then that would, um, yeah, that would help a lot with, um, with the housing crisis. Yeah. No, this is the, the, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, really great ideas, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a, a really great, great chat and to, to get your insights on this. Um, yeah, really important issue. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for having me. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Andrea, as always. Yeah. Great to chat to you, Jackie. And um, yeah, good to talk to you again, Tim. You've been listening to Beyond the Rona. Caption audio is available on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to visit beyondtherona.com to listen to previous episodes or get in touch. Catch you next time.